we're, this is the third Sunday that we're in our series on lost and found. And Luke 15 is the lost and found chapter in God's Word. The first week we uh, saw that there were a hundred sheep, but they had a shepherd. Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, went looking for the one that carelessly uh, lost his way. And I'm grateful that we have a Savior who goes to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what he said his, his mission was, was to come for us that had, uh, by our own, well, stupidity, we just walk off on our own, and we need somebody to come find us. Last Sunday, we talked about the, the woman, the second parable that Jesus told, that swept the house. She had a coin that she had lost. It was a very valuable coin to her. And I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit is the one that searches out for us. We cannot hide from him. From him. He knows where we are. He knows what's in our minds and in our thoughts. He knows the feelings of our heart. So he comes to find us and draw us to himself. And he does not cease until the mission is accomplished, until he's done everything that he set out to do. Today, a very familiar story. Uh, some great authors in literature say it's the greatest story that's ever been told. Well, it's written by or told by the greatest one who ever told the story, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is about the Father. And I'm sure that it had everyone's attention, and you could probably hear the special anointing on my, my Savior's words as he spoke <clears throat> about the mission of the loving Father. In our world today, we need a lot. Everybody knows that. We're broken. Our society's broken. Uh, we've, we've left some things that we probably... Uh, cherished one time but now doesn't mean as much to us and everybody gets the description of the heavenly father from their earthly father and sometimes that is a wreck and a mess but Jesus wanted us to know that there is a father who's there now in the parable of the 99 sheep and the one that was lost the shepherd went after that sheep until he was found in the parable of the ten coins, when one was lost, the Holy Spirit searched until the one was found. But today in this story, we see the Father being loving, kind, standing firm in His truth, and allows the Son to wander astray, but the Father stood loving. Stand with me, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word. We'll begin looking in Scripture today in verse number 11. I'm reading out the New King James. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there, here's one of the saddest statements in the Word of God, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. It's sad because it's repeated so often. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one, no one, no one gave him anything. Here's the most powerful phrase. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But he, when, he, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And he said to his son, Father, I have, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. 
For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truths. Jesus, I thank you for uh, putting this truth in a, in a story form that we can relate to. But Lord, may we hear more than just the story. Holy Spirit, speak truth to our hearts and our lives. Father, many of us are broken. Many of us are hurting. Many of us are empty in many ways in our life. And yet, you are the loving Father who desires so much for us. You are rich and increased with goods. You have need of nothing, but you desire us. So Lord, do a Jesus work in our midst today. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will draw us into yourself. And Lord, I pray that as we see ourselves as small and as we truly see you as a, a large, great, glorious, good, good Father, Father, may we be reconciled once again to you so that we could have the heaven walk, the Father walk now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Here's the story of a father with two sons. We'll speak about one of the sons next week. But today we look at the younger son. He had the father who loved him. He grew up in his home. He knew all of the greatest advantages of life. His father was uh, like the men of that day. Uh, their, their wealth was built in the agriculture of lands the produce. He had many servants there to work the land, and you basically went from season to season. It was always work. You, had, uh, you couldn't take time off, so to speak. There was always something to do, but praise God for the gift of work. Praise God for the gift of life and responsibility. Uh, some people shun work. Some people uh, feel like uh, things should be done for them, but, but we were built for work. God made us with a desire to, to take care of our family, to provide for those that we love, to, to put in a, a good, honest day's work and go home and feel good about it, to, to build for your family. Hopefully, parents will always want more for your children than you would even have for yourself. It was usual in the, the families of that day that, that you would see maybe two, three, or even four generations living together on the land, working together, fellowshipping together, loving together, living life together. But the younger son had had enough. The younger son, he had other dreams. He had other wants and desires. He wanted to live life his way. Like some children, he looked to his parents and thought his parents who raised him were uh, holding him back and confining him and keeping him from the good life and the fun life. And he had friends and he wanted to go do his thing. One day, probably very boldly, he went to uh, ask of his father something. He said, Dad, I know my brother and I one day what you have will be ours. Dad, if it's all right with you, I'd like to have mine now. In the day then, the Asian community, if there were two sons, the firstborn son would get a double portion. If there were two children, the, the, the lively, the, all the livelihood, all the lands, the houses, everything would, would, would be split into three. The older son would get two-thirds, and the younger son would get one-third. The older son would have a greater responsibility. So the younger son is, is almost like saying, Dad, my brother's here. My brother, uh, he'll take care of things, but I want to do my thing. I want to go my way. I want to do what I want to do. Now, the father would not have to, but in this particular case, the father did do Asked this, did what the, the son asked to do. Now, the way this would have to be done is one third of his lands would have to be sold. 
Now, not sold as far as changing a deed. In their calendar, every 50 years, there would be something called the year of Jubilee. And if you got into a financial bond, you could borrow against your property or you could lease it out to someone else. And depending on how many years there were between this year and the year of Jubilee, that's the price that you could get for your land. It would no longer be yours as far as someone else would work the field. Someone else would get the benefit of the crop. You would just get the money now, and they could have the use of the land. So the father did that, and he took of all of his properties, one-third of it, leased it out, someone else took the money that was given and gave them to his son. Now, in that day, the three worst things that a son could do were committed by this younger son. Number one, to ask for his inheritance ahead of time. Basically, he's going to the dad and saying, Dad, and I don't mean to be rude here, but it's like he's saying, Dad, you're dead to me. Dad, I, I want to live my life and you really don't matter. Just give me that which is mine now. And then... In that day, family was to stay together and take care of. You took care of the children when you were, they were young and they couldn't take care of themselves. But this thing called age comes on and we grow older and we may need someone to take care of us and the children would take care of the older generation. But this son took what was, was given to him and he left. Dad, you're, you're, you're good as dead to me and... Dad, I really don't care about you. You're on your own. He left. And then it says that he went, the younger son went to a far country and he joined himself and he began to live what we today know as prodigal. That's why it's called the, the story of the prodigal son. Wild, willful living. He wasted. Live for today. Give me the, the high life today. And he took, when you've got money in your hands, you're going to have friends. As long as he was buying for others, others would allow it. He probably bought the greatest of wines and um, joined himself with the people that he wanted to join himself with. Can, is, is that as G-rated as I could say in this place today? Y'all give me an uh-huh. All right. So basically, he lived a very promiscuous life, a life of, well, just a life of sin, willful sin. The third worst thing that a Jewish boy could do in that day is just to squander the inheritance, and he did. You know, there are people today who think that my life could be good if I just did this. But I've come to find out, usually when people are trying to build meaning into the life, it's because they don't see meaning in the life. They're trying to fill a void or an emptiness in themselves so they might go off and, and, and have the party life and drink and drug and sex and all those things. But that usually is just covering up something hurtful and painful within them. They think money, friends, prestige, possessions, if I can just have that, then, then, then I'll be happy. No, no. You are who you are. You're born into this world. Naked you came, naked you'll leave. What you are in life is who you are. And either you're going to be satisfied with how God made you for the relationship that he offers with the Father, or you're going to think that you have to add to it. I need something else. I want people to, to, to look well upon me, so I need good clothes, and I've got to be educated, and I've got to speak well, and, and, and I've got to be friendly so that they'll like me, and I've got to lie so I won't get in trouble, and, and I've got to cheat so that I can have that's deficit living. It's never enough. 
The more you try to build yourself up, the smaller you're really making yourself out to be. But God has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. Not just when we go to heaven, but how we can walk it now. There are some people today that they don't have everything that the world says is important. But they have significance and peace. They love and they are loved. And that place, that hole in their life, Voltaire said, it can only be filled by God. By the way, he ended that way. He didn't begin that way. This young man thought he had everything. But what he found out was he lost everything. And this little Jewish boy began to be in want. What are you going to do when the money's gone? The friends are no longer there. If possessions make you happy, what are you going to do without the possessions? Clothes don't make the man. Jesus had no change of garment. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? He began to be in want. Really, all he did was he saw himself for who he really, really was. I have a friend. Y'all ever heard of Rock Bottom? Praise God for finding Rock Bottom. He said he found Rock Bottom, but then he found out that Rock Bottom had a basement. <laughs> when you don't think you can get any lower, somehow we do. He lost it all. He was hungry. He went and joined himself to one of the, the, the people of the country that he lived in. And get this, the thing that he didn't want to do with his dad was, was work the farm and be faithful there. But now he finds that he is now a servant for someone else. And this Jewish boy is serving pigs. They didn't like pigs. They never ate bacon. That's, I thought I'd get an amen on bacon. Anybody like bacon in this place? Pigs are nasty. Anybody ever raised pigs in here? Some of y'all, bless y'all, some of you did. When I was a small kid, uh, we had a church member that raised pigs, and they thought it would be important that I come and feed them. <laughs> Those were the sloppiest things I've ever seen. And y'all know, what, when they call them slopping pigs, that's what it was. I mean, it was a bucket, bucket of stuff that, oh my goodness. Amen? And it says that this man would have filled his stomach with the food fit for the pigs, rock bottom, with a basement. Can I just ask a simple question? What's it going to take for some people? How worse is it going to have to get? Well, one day he decided... You know, my dad's servants have it better than me. Maybe dad wasn't that bad after all. Listen to these words. I will arise and go to my father's house. Kyle Eidelman, the great preacher up in Louisville, Kentucky, calls this the aha moment. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Aha. When the light comes on. When you look at things and you say, you know, it really wasn't that bad before. Coming to your senses. I want to share with you that everyone in this building, I pray, has an aha moment. Matter of fact, I've had quite a few. Quite a few. When you think that you've got it figured out, but you don't. 
You see, the beginning of wisdom is humility. And the father could have kept his son from leaving, or he could have tried. But he trusted the works of of God, and he let the son go. And the son did everything that he thought was good and right, but then he found out that that only led to emptiness. And sooner or later, we've got to come to a place in time when we say, I'm living a life of sin and emptiness, but there's a father who loves me, who wants so much better for me. And I think I'll leave the place that I am and go to the place that he's at. I think I'll leave the place of want and go to the place of bounty. I think I'll go to the place of emptiness and hurt and brokenness and fear and shame and condemnation and go to my father and confess that I was wrong. As a matter of fact, he practiced what he was going to say to his dad. He arises and he's beginning the journey. And he he said, I I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. He probably had his head hanging down all the way, practicing over and over again. What will my father say? But I don't care. Anything's better than this. Anything's better than this. Well, be careful. Some things that you think may be better will only take you further down the wrong road. So, as he's getting closer, verse 20, he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a a great way off, I don't know how far, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. You know what that tells me? Dad was over on the edge of the property, probably had worn out a place in the grass where he would go there every day and look. And look, and look. Ephesians is called the earnest expectation. Church, look at me. I I, I thought to myself, earnest expectation? I looked it up, and this is what it means. Literally a stretching of the neck. You ever been looking for something and longingly looked? Sir, maybe, could it be? Praise God. Now, you want a picture of the Heavenly Father? Here's the, here's the best picture of the Father. He's not mad. He's not angry. He's looking and waiting. <laughs> Longingly looking. And when he sees him afar off, look what it says. He had compassion. My son. My son. And he says that he ran. Men in that day, men in that culture, they did not run. But there was something. He didn't care about being dignified. He had to get from where he was to where he is. I promise you, if you will repent of your sin, come to your senses, and take one step for God, he'll take a thousand steps for you. If you will find the end of yourself, you'll find a God with his arms outstretched running to embrace you. He fell on his neck. And he kissed him. I don't think that's what the son was expecting. Amen? Y'all have heard me talk about hugging. I'm not a great big hugger. But there is a difference, Brother Ricky, between being hugged and hugging someone. I think that son probably didn't know what to do. He's kind of going, uh, uh. But I think the father just... And I don't know how long he held him, but he kissed him, 
And I think something happened inside that prodigal boy. I think he began to melt. How long has it been since you melt in the Father's arms? Come on now, Christian, believer, how long has it been since you took the heaviness of life and you ran to the Father and let the Father's arms just wrap around you and kiss you and love on you and you just melted into his arms? That's a good place to be. And before he could even get the apology out, The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. No longer be worthy to call your son. The father said to his servant, get the best robe. <laughs> Go to my closet. Get the best thing in the house. That which belongs to the father. Bring it. Put it on my boy. Hey, this is my son. Get the ring that shows that he belongs. Get the ring that shows that it is family. Get the ring that says that he belongs. Put it on his hand. Slaves barefoot. My boy's not going to be barefoot. Get some sandals to put on his feet. By the way, we're going to celebrate tonight. You know the one that we've been, we've been waiting for this special day? Get the fatted calf. Get the best one. Get the top of the line. And kill the fatted calf. It doesn't matter. We're going to have a party tonight. We're going to celebrate because my son, who was lost, is now home. So many people are afraid of coming to God and getting spanked. So many are afraid that they're going to get lectured. So many are afraid that God's going to take his finger and say, I told you so. What Jesus is saying is the Father just wants to put his arms around you and love on you just a little bit. All that I have is yours. All the blessings are yours. I don't know too much about heaven, but I'd say it's a pretty cool place. I say that everybody loves everybody and there's only joy. There will be eating in heaven. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. I'm Baptist. There will be fried chicken. <clears throat> I've talked to the Lord. There will be no coconut in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I don't know. But I tell you what, when you're in the Father's house, there's no want. <laughs> And I'm not talking about the white robes. I'm not talking about the crowns. I, that's stuff to lay at his feet. They talk about streets of gold. My dad said that's pavement. What you think is the most important thing, we just use it for pavement up here. What's valuable is souls. What's valuable is a life. I've talked to so many people in this world and, and they just, they all come broken and their tears down their face and, and they don't think that they are worth anything. They don't think anybody could love them. I'm here to tell you, God loves you completely. Everything that is of the Father that belongs to Him, that's not important. Calvary was important. The blood that was shed so that we could have redemption of our sins. That's what was important. And any old soul will do. So many times we think we got to get cleaned up and then God will love us. How stupid is that? He's the one that does the cleaning. I can't clean myself up. I've been a Christian for 47 years. And the one thing I know is, is every day I have to say, Father, forgive me, I have sinned. Father, would you do in my life what only you could do? Look beyond my faults and see my need. And meet me there. What a beautiful picture of a father with his arms wide open. I don't care 
If you don't think you're worthy of that, He says you are. Quit looking at yourself the way you judge yourself. You don't have a right to judge yourself by a higher standard than Him. The way of the cross leads home. How long has it been since you've been with the Father? If you've never had your aha moment, if you've never come to your senses and said, it's time for me to come home, that's where it begins. Don't let your pride, don't let your ego get in the way. God wants you to come home. Have you strayed? Have you wandered astray? Come home. Come home. Our Father, we love you, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you. Brother Mark said it earlier, there's a lot of hurting people. We know that. Lord, we confess and we know that you are the answer. Father, I don't know the hearts of all the people that are here, but if there is someone here today that has never come to you and asked you to save them, to change them, they've never repented of their sins and their way of life, and ask you to accept them back home. Father, I pray that today they will. I pray that they will have the wisdom and the desire, oh God, to pray and confess their sins and ask you to save them. Father, may that happen today. And Lord, if there's someone here that is already a Christian, but they've wandered away too, Father, speak to them. Let them know the Father's still there. Lord, if they'll take one step to Him, He'll take a thousand for them. Oh, Lord, fill us with Your joy and Your peace and Your love and Your bounty once again. May we not live the life of starvation and pride. Lord, I know You'll accept us. May we come. May your will be done during the invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.